That looked amazing. Thank you so much for sticking around. Um, I'm here to introduce our moderator for this evening, Andrew Ahn, who is a, yes. Andrew Ahn is a queer Korean American filmmaker born and raised in Los Angeles. Ahn's latest feature, Fire Island, is currently streaming on Hulu and Disney Plus internationally. The film won the Ensemble Tribute of the 2023 Gotham Awards and a GLAAD Award for Outstanding Film Streaming TV. It is nominated for two Emmy Awards for Outstanding Television Movie and Outstanding Writing for a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie. His sophomore feature, Driveways, yes, premiered at the 2019 Berlinale and was nominated for two Independent Spirit Awards for Best First Screenplay, and Best League Actress for Hong Chao. An's first film, Spa Night, premiered at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival and won a special jury award for breakthrough performance. The film went on to win the 2017 John Cassavetes Film Independent Spirit Award. He has promoted diversity in the arts by mentoring youth filmmakers through programs like Pacific Arts Movement's Real Voices, Outfest's Outset, and the Sundance Institute's Native Filmmaker Lab. He graduated from Brown University and received an MFA from CalArts. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Andrew Ahn. Hi everyone, uh, that was fucking incredible. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm going to introduce Greg, I'm going to read his bio just so that we kind of get the full context, but I'll also say a few special words. So Greg Araki earned an MFA in film production from the USC School of Cinema and TV and a BA in film studies from UC Santa Barbara. His films are screened at the world's most renowned film festivals including Sundance, Cannes, Berlin, Venice, Toronto, New York, London, and Deauville. Araki has made 11 acclaimed independent features including White Bird and Blizzard, Kaboom, Smiley Face, Mysterious Skin, Splendor, Nowhere, The Doom Generation, Totally Fucked Up, and The Living End. He has also directed uh, episodes of numerous TV shows, including Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story, American Gigolo, 13 Reasons Why, Red Oaks, Riverdale, Heathers, and American Crime. In 2019, Araki created, co-wrote, and directed 10 episodes of Now Apocalypse, a star series to executive produced with Steven Soderbergh and Gregory Jacobs. Um, I have to say, um, I've been asked kind of, you know, throughout my career if I would you know, uh, moderate a conversation with Greg or do an interview, and um, every time that comes up, I, I say yes because I want to be associated with Greg in any way <laughs> possible. Um, I am so honored that, um, you know, we've gotten to hang out and uh, for me to just to get to know him, and he's such a lovely, lovely person, um, and the Gaijin writer director <laughs> that has the best. Uh, bone structure and, <laughs> and abs. Um, and so everybody, please uh, welcome back to the stage, Greg Araki. Uh, how does that feel, watching it? Fucking amazing. Thank you, everybody, so much. I would just like my cast, if there's the ones that are still here, can you please stand up and take a fucking bow? One of the things I really noticed when I was remastering is the performances in this movie, and there's, I'm so sad Jimmy's not here, but it's so fantastic because it's such a, everyone's so great and so real and so emotional, and it's so important in a movie like this, it's so stylized and crazy and, and weird to have like that human core, and so, Hats off to all the actors. I, I mean, we shot in like you know, 23 days. I was, you know, it was like a little indie movie, and we did, you know, Patty Podesta, please take a bow, also, and Sarah Slotnick. I mean, we had no money. I mean, it was like, I'm here a million dollars. Andrea will attest to this. It's like, we had a budget of two million, and we're in prep, and they're like, oh, we're cutting your budget to one million. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so, um, 
it was very tight, very crazy, but nowhere to this day was one of the most magical, special experiences of my life. Like, we, I mean, I love the Doom Generation, and, you know, it has such a fond, it has such a fond place in my heart, but we shot Doom Generation, as Andrea will attest to, and Jim Feely, who was the DP, I remember him, we just saw him in New York for the Doom screenings, and Doom Generation was a very hard shoot. It was the dead of winter, all nights, freezing cold. Um, it was the Northridge earthquake, the second day of photography, like red cars. I mean, it was just like one thing after another after another. It was really hard. I mean, I loved the movie, and I love. I have such fond memories of it. But it was tough, and and nowhere was the opposite. It was summer. Everybody was so fun and cool, and it was just like a giant party, and like everybody loved everybody, and the trailers, they used to they just have these little three bangers, and they would open all the doors, and they just have a big party in the back, in the, in the um, parking lot while we were trying to film. And so um, it was just such a special experience, and the chance to remaster it and revisit it again has been so um, amazing for me. So thank you to... Um, yeah, again, all the people that helped with it. It's it's so incredible to, to watch again. I, I mentioned to Greg that like I had watched in film school like a shitty like VHS copy version and uh, like I did I didn't even know that Montgomery had different colored eyes, you know, because it was like that degraded, like that well watched, like well loved. Um, but um, I, I I love the story you're telling about. Um, uh, the the making of the film because I feel like that joy and that energy really is is felt you know it, by watching just this incredible ensemble um, we we have to talk about the cast because there's so many incredible people there you know um, uh, how did it uh, all come together how did you find them like what was what were you looking for in each of those it you know was actors cra it was a really crazy experience um. We had, we had like, I think, four casting directors. It was really very involved. And um, I remember there's a lot of people, like, because this is, you know, whatever, 1995, I guess, or 94 when we were casting it. And, you know, I think I, rem I would just like, just meet like a million actors. And it wouldn't even, they wouldn't even come in to read for a part yet. I just met everybody, like almost like a speed dating thing. <laughs> and like Matt Damon kind of came in, like Sarah Michelle Gellar, like all these people. I'm like, nah. <laughs> and I was really looking for just like a special thing. Like I, I always say that, that um, casting is almost like dating. I'm not that I ever date my actors. In a certain circumstance, but um, <laughs> that it's you're just looking for you know, that spark and that energy, that thing. Like I, you just, and when you see it, you see it. You know what I mean? So I would literally have meet like dozens, and dozens, and dozens, like ev like every young actor out there, and um, I would sort of like go, oh, oh, maybe this is a ducky, or maybe this is a ding bag, or maybe this is a yeah. You know I mean, they'd be on lists, and then they come in and read, and then they read for a different part, a different part. And so it was just a, that kind of process. And, you know, we just fucking got so lucky and just got the amazing actors and they just had such great chemistry. And it was, everybody was, it was just one of those experiences, you know. Did, did anybody ever come in and um, kind of change your concept of the character? It's like, oh, like, you know, this person is actually making me think of this character in a slightly different way from how you'd maybe written it? Um, Yes and no. Everybody definitely um, surprised me. You know what I mean? In a way that it's always the director is super fun to be surprised, you know? But they, I'm very specific and I had a very specific um, image in my head. So, um, like I said, yes and no. Uh, I'll come back to kind of the performances and, and the chemistry between the, the actors uh, later, but I, I want to talk about. Um, uh, your crew now, you know, your, your key creative collaborators, um, you know, the production design, the costume design, the cinematography, it, it looks so now in this incredible way, which is so fun to see. And like my boyfriend and I were just like looking at the audience here being like, man, they like look like they came straight out of an Iraqi movie, you know? Um, can you talk about the, the look of the film and, and how you collaborated with your team to, to find it, to, to put it all together? I just was very, I mean, it, same with Doom Generation, 
Uh, and even Totally Fucked Up and Living In, the movies that we didn't have a production designer, didn't have a DP, I was just very interested in kind of like surrealism, stylized reality, and this idea that nothing looked normal. Do you know what I mean? Like they don't go to just like a whatever, Denny. <laughs> you know what I mean? That it, everything, they, every place they go, every location that we pick, um, Chris Ball's not here by chance, is he? Um, he's the location guy, and he actually came to one of our Doom Generation screenings at the Alamo um, in spring, and just sort of popped out of nowhere. Um, but I remember we were just, I was so hard on him, I was like, literally like, no, no, that looks too ordinary. That was like, like, and that's how we got these crazy, crazy ass locations. And again, the genius of Patty Podesta, um, the, uh, for instance, like, um, uh, the the condo that Zoe lives in is literally like a, a, the DWP plant um, in <laughs> whatever somewhere in the valley, and it was just decorated to make it because I didn't want her to drive up to a regular fucking condo <laughs> and then he pops out of the car. I wanted it to be like this spectacular, crazy, weird place, and so everything in the um, movie was like that. And I remember like, what does Juju Fruit's house look like? And I literally. And Andrew can probably attest to this. And I was talking to Chris Bob about it when I saw him. I said, I remember distinctly drawing a piece of cheese mm. <laughs> on a piece of paper and going, I want, I want a house that looks like this. So <laughs> literally, it was like that, like a piece of cheese. I'm like, okay, but like, so that's in and, and Juju Fruit's house. So front of Juju Fruit's house was also some sort of like water reclamation plant or whatever that Patty sort of dressed up to make like a look like a crazy place. So every room, every space had to have a weird ass thing going on. So it was just something, and I think that's one of the reasons why the movie, outside of the fucking you know phone machines and stuff like that, it hasn't dated because it's sort of happening in this whole other world that is kind of beyond reality and that's kind of what I always wanted it to be. W would you say the same thing about like the costuming? Was it that that feel like an exaggerated version or was that kind of what you're seeing like people wearing then? Like, <laughs> Well it's interesting because um, like Sarah again she had to like fucking pull up. <laughs> She had to really pull off kind of a magic trick to make it happen because there's no money and so like literally how she made all that stuff happen and like a lot of that was handmade like eggs dressed with flowers like they were hand sewn and like four of them because they got ripped and stuff and so there was just a lot of love and a lot of care and a lot of Pat you know Patty at the time was teaching at Cal Arts and so we had a lot of artists in the art department and they painted the mural of Jimmy on the wall and they, you know, they, it, there, was, there was just so much artistic, creative energy on that set. It was just fantastic and amazing. I, I love like all the bedrooms, you know, like the, it, because I think it really captures so much about <coughs> like a teen's, you know, like psyche and, and, and I think that this film does better than you know any other film like just capturing the 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 joy the the trauma the um desire the um uh the kind of lostness that like i think teenagers grapple with you know and it's just so lovingly rendered like how did the idea kind of come about like like I mean that's one of the things like people are you know you're fucking old like why do you keep making movies about like teenagers and young people <laughs> and one of the things for me personally is that you know now that I'm in my 60s I mean I'm just very you know my boyfriend can test this we're just super subtle super happy super figured everything I, I feel like the older you get when you turn 30 when you turn 40 when you turn 50 Every decade for me is more and more, you're more comfortable in your skin, you know who you are, you, you know, you just, as you grow up, as you get older, I find that I'm happier than I ever was, but also more boring than fucking everything, <laughs> you know, super boring. So uh, the thing is, is but if, for young people, for teenagers, and also like now Pacos, they're, they're like in their 20s, I feel like when people are young, they're lives are dramatic and there's highs and there's lows and you're super depressed and then you're super in love with and that is a filmmaker so exciting and fun you know what i mean it's dynamic it's like shit's going on and it's just there's confusions and like all of it is very 
it much it, it's, it makes for great cinema to me because it's like it's not just me going to Trader Joe's. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I I think that like the film like captures kind of like bisexuality, like pansexuality, in like kind of an incredible way that feels so current and and also you know kind of open relationships, you know that kind of love triangle of dark like Mel and Lucifer, like. It's so it's key. It, it's, it's, it, it's yeah, exactly servant key. It's it's just such a um, uh, like at the time were you did, did that feel like really progressive or did that just feel kind of like you know something that you'd experienced? Like where did that kind of um, uh, handling of sexuality come from? I don't know. A lot of it to me is you know. You know, my films are really personal and very much kind of in my head and my what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and where I'm at. And so it was, you know, it was shocking to me or shocking for the world because um, I was so known from the living end and totally fucked up. It's like Green Way, Boba, Greg Rocky, and like right after nowhere, I started dating a woman and feel like a what the fuck? And John Waters, who has a who has this exhibit opening on Sunday. Um, <laughs> He, he, he said, did you hear about Greg Rocky? He went in. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just like so scandalous that, that, um, that like, because I was so known as a queer gay filmmaker. And, but I always, I've always said this, you know, and felt that, you know, sexuality is the, on the spectrum. You know what I mean? It's just like the Kinsey scale. And, you know, and that's something that is so much more interesting to me. And, I, and you know, Totally Fucked Up talks about this too. It's like, I was never like a good gay. You know what I mean? I was never like the, the regular kind of gay. I was like always like the punk rock, weird like outsider gay that didn't fit into the whole gay world. So, you know, it's it that definitely sort of um, was a part, very big part of my identity, you know, when I was in my 20s, early 30s. I I love the, you mentioned this before you know like when you're giving flowers to your cast you know like that they took something that you know is so stylized and and big and and brought like a humanity to it and that that's one of my favorite parts of the film is just um, like how incredible these performances are and this like tenderness you know like. Um, like cowboy up on the rooftop, you know, like Tony. M O D. Yeah, like it's like such an incredible performance. Like I love it, you know. And then the tenderness between um, Rachel True and Jimmy, you know. And then at the end, you know, like that that very real connection between um, uh, Montgomery and and Dark Nathan Bexton and and Jimmy. It's just it's so amazing. And then you have like Montgomery explode into a cockroach, like a giant space cockroach. And so it's that balance that's so incredible. Like, like was that always kind of the, the attitude that you wanted? Like, kind of like, let's give them tender and sincere, but then also like, let's fuck it up, like, let's be punk. Like, how do you balance those two things and make a cohesive movie? Hey, it's just really like, I, it's just, I don't know where all the shit comes from. I mean, the, the cockroach is obviously sort of Kafkaesque and all that, and you know, the, the aliens are, you know, kind of 50s, 60s, cheesy sci-fi kind of tropes, and, um, but it's all just kind of in my head. You know, I always said in those days, I'm just kind of a sponge and absorb like all kinds of stuff. So when I sit to write a script, it's just like squeezing the sponge and seeing what comes out. And I remember when I wrote that Dark Montgomery scene, um, I remember I was in the Insomnia Cafe in the 90s. Uh, it, it was like one o'clock in the morning, and I just start. I used to write my scripts on paper, longhand, um, on the backs of like flyers and shit. And I, I just remember writing that scene, just like, and, and it just kind of came out of me. I don't know where it fucking came from, but um, the funny thing about the Montgomery scene is that it originally was not supposed to be in the proper movie. Like it was originally supposed to end with Montgomery coming to the window and going, the strangest thing just happened to me. And then, God, that's the end of the movie. So that was like a, kit, like a cliffhanger. And then the Montgomery scene, the continuation, was supposed to be after the credits, where the, where the, little, the shot of Jimmy screaming is now. And that's how I originally thought of it. I think it's how it is in the original script. But when I 
saw that same cut, I was like, this scene, I, like, I wanted it to be sort of like half the audience had left already and they missed like this scene, but I really wanted the movie to have that scene in it, so we moved it to this, to the uh, body of this movie. I, 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 I love that scene, it's, it's so incredible. Um, you know, unlike like Totally Fucked Up in Doom Generation, like this feels more um, like vignette right? Like I, I was thinking about it, it feels kind of like like, um, American like, Team Tampopo. Like, you know? like 90210 on acid or whatever the reviews say. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it was actually, I was very interested, the note was actually written kind of as a TV pilot. Um, this was right, you know, post Twin Peaks, and Twin Peaks was released in Europe, the pilot of it, as a theater. <coughs> and so there was this idea for me of making kind of a teen soap opera pilot that would be a feature, and then also um, become series, and I actually had a deal at like, uh, MTV Productions or something. We, I wrote like three scripts of the series, and which are they're probably online sometimes, but but they're like crazy. Like the show just got crazier and crazier and crazier. But it was all very, um, yeah, it was very like kind of Twin Peaks teenage soap opera, just crazy shit happening. Did you get, get, like? Did you know that you wanted this to be like the third like the end of a trilogy or like or or I actually like don't know like did the like teen apocalypse trilogy come after you made this like the, like people put it together or or was it something you like starting from totally fucked up you're like I'm gonna do this if you were here last night you would know that sorry <laughs> uh, the teen apocalypse trilogy actually came about because of totally fucked up which was supposed to be sort of my um like gay lesbian masculine feminine and I was so Super into Godard and super. I just wanted to make remake basically masculine feminine about gay and lesbian teenagers, and so that was that. And then it was the experience of making that and working with you know Jimmy for the first time, and also all the other cast members Gilbert and Rocco Dalek and Susan and Lance and Jenny. Just working with them, you know, because it was a low budget movie, so we didn't shoot on a regular schedule, it stretched out over months, you know, so I got, really got to know these kids and really kind of basically was hanging out with them for at least six months. And so it's knowing them that really sort of inspired me. They were just really cool and kind of open-minded and it gave me kind of hope for the future. And I don't know, there's something about being with these, 19 year old kids for a long time that made me want to make the trilogy and then I decided to make the trilogy with, and put Jimmy in all three movies so I wrote the part of Jordan in Doom Generation and Dark in Nowhere for um, oh, kind of around Jimmy but it was supposed to be a trilogy from, from then. Um, you know you've had this uh, kind of uh, look back at your um, you know career uh, because of these restorations, um, you know, uh, how does it feel to kind of think back on that time now, you know, like what is, are you, uh, I, I, like I remember chatting with you for the IndieWire piece and then also just reading other interviews where you talk about like kind of the purity of it, you know, like is that something that you miss that you are, you know, like done and over with, like how do you feel about kind of looking back on your uh, on your career? I mean, you know, revisiting Doom and Nowhere like this has been so amazing and um, brings back so many memories and just watching Nowhere, just <laughs> it was just a, like a really emotional experience for me. And I'm sure you know this too, it's like one of the huge advantages or amazing things about being a filmmaker is that you really have a time capsule. And, like this is exactly who I fucking was in 1996, like in 1995. Like this is all I was thinking about. This is what I cared about. This is the music I was listening to. Like it's everything that was so important to me. And so obviously I've changed a little bit, but for any for people who've seen now Apocalypse, it's still fucking same craziness. You know what I mean? <laughs> same, same. A related alien. Not that it's not Roscoe, but it's his, it's, his, it's his ancestor, and just like the same idea of living in this kind of stylized, nightmare, crazy, sexualized world. So, um, yeah. So, like, you know, time hasn't changed me. Anyway. Well, Unfortunately, I guess. No. Uh, I mean, kind of going off of that, like, how do you feel like, like these works, like 
you know, are in conversation with what's happening today in society, like for teens today, like, you know, do you, do you feel like there's a lot of resonance or do you feel like there's actually like big differences? I mean, it's always amazing to me at these Jim generation and nowhere strengths, like how many young people there are and it's like, how the hell did you find <laughs> this fucking movie? And it's really, um, and there's something about these movies, and I think it's the same with John Waters. It's just like, it's the purity of them, I think, and the expressiveness that doesn't really age, you know? So it's something that speaks through the generations like, for like the kind of outsiders and the weirdos and the, and the kids that are not, you know, whatever, the little yucky kids or little whatever kids. Um, <laughs> nowhere in particular has a very, very strong um, non-binary trans, trans following, which is amazing. And, um, you know, and it's, I remember the first time I was at Coachella, I really loved being there so much because it felt like nowhere to me. Like it felt like nowhere to come to life. Like it's like all these beautiful kids running around, everyone's kind of, you know, non whatever. <laughs> they're not just a bunch of straight kids, it's just like they're whatever they are that weekend and there's like bands playing and it's just like this kind of utopian paradise and that's really, um, I mean, I, I think that, that the, you know, that's why I used to love Coachella. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're getting toward the end but I, I, I need to ask about the, the music, you know, the, the incredible music, like how did you... Was it a little bit too loud tonight or is it okay? <laughs> loved it. People loved it. <laughs> Literally, when I heard when we did the sound check yesterday, um, I came on, turn up, turn up. Yeah, it hit me get louder, louder, louder. It's just like I don't want, I don't want people's ears to bleed. But when that slow dive song is playing at the beginning in the shower scene, it's just like. Oh. <laughs> it had, had like, did you work with like your music supervisor? Was this just like shit you're listening to? Like, yeah, I always just kind of put. Like, I'm a, cult, I'm a music head, so I, it's like a lot of my personal collection ends up in, um, ends up in movies. And it's weird, like, because I'm so into the music and stuff. I remember when we did Mystery Skin, um, we used that song Golden Hair, you know what I mean? Which was, at that time, completely unknown. Like, it was the B-side of a single, like an import single, and nobody knew what it was. And the record company, even, we said, um, yeah, we want to use the song Golden Hair. It's like, that's not our song. It's like, I'm looking at the record right now, and it says it's your song. Like, literally, it's like, I was really into, like, using these kind of obscure, weird B-sides and weird stuff, weird remixes and all that, but, you know, the 90s. <laughs> um, because we're here in L.A., um, you know, and I, I like, I was seeing people come in, and I know a couple of people, like a lot of filmmakers in the audience, you know, like I'm, I'm curious to know, like, you know, what do you hope for this next generation of filmmakers? Like, what do you want them to know to like serve them well or to help them make more and more interesting work? Well, it's, it's funny, like me and Rick Winkletter, like we're, you know, and Gus Van Zandt, we all go way back to like, you know, the late 80s. <laughs> like we're all the grandpas of the indie world now. And um, I remember talking to Rick a few years ago, and it's like, when we made our, you know, when he made Slacker, and I was making Three Little People in the Night, or Gus was making Malanochi or whatever, it's fucking really, you've never made a movie in 60 millimeter, right? Shorts. Yeah, yeah, but like, making a feature 60 millimeter is really fucking hard. <laughs> like, loading the magazines and the sprocket holes and the fucking sinking the sound and all, like, editing it in a movie. It's all so hard. And now, with, I, you know, I shot this on my phone and I did this and I edited it on my phone. And, you know what I mean? It's just, everything's so easy. It's like, the bar is like way lower. You know what I mean? So it's like, literally, like, it's so much easier to make a movie than ever, but um, it's like, the fact you had to be kind of almost insane to make a feature movie in 60 millimeter with no money, and that's why, like, a lot of us really bonded because it was really like, Oh, we're all crazy, we're all here at fucking Sundance with our movie that we 
died making. And so my thing about the, I mean, I get asked like, oh, who's the hot comic or what's the new queer wave, new wave, what's happening? And I don't, I'm all, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not a great person to ask that because I'm not a critic or I'm not a programmer, which is like, you know, can you tell me from Sunday? She knows everybody that's coming up. She knows all the shorts filmmakers. She knows who's who, what's happening. You know, like who the buzzy filmmakers. I mean, I try to keep up, but uh, don't. But my big thing is, and that's one thing about, you know, I don't know if it's because I'm of a different time or what, but it's like I always marched on my own drummer and did my own thing, and was because I was so into punk rock music and new wave music. Um, it's having a really distinct voice. You know what I mean? Like having something to say and being your own thing. You know what I mean? Like so much stuff now is kind of homogenized and all the same, and it's really like, um, I don't know, that's my thing. I feel like so many people want to be directors, they want to be filmmakers because they see like, oh, Ryan Coogler just made fucking Black Panther 3 and fucking <laughs> King of the World. But it's like really like where they're, um, you know, what are they gonna say, what do they want to say kind of? And that's one thing that we were like because I think we were all nuts, but we just really had this burning thing to say. <laughs> and that's kind of, um, anyway. End of sermon. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so excited, you know, for uh, the film to, to get out there and for more people to see Nowhere, you know. Yeah, it, like... it will be playing, um, actually, again, theatrically. My friend Dave is all, I'm so sad that it's going to be over soon. <laughs> it's going to be playing, again, um, theatrically in L.A. at um, Cinematech, at the Elmo Draft House, the New Art. It's a, like October or something. I don't know. Mar Ask Marcus. It'll be on the Strand website. But So if you want to see it again on big screen, but it won't be this big. It won't be like this fucking dream, dream scenario. But, and then it's opening in like San Francisco, we're going to Austin next weekend, or it'll be in New York, so it's gonna be Nowhere Lives Again. Thanks to Marcus and Strand releasing. Uh, Greg, any last things you want to say to fans? I to honestly just want to say thank you um, to the fans. Like literally, I can't, I, you know, when we made this movie, you know, I'm usually, you know, Jimmy's usually these things, and we just talk about, you know, we made these little weird punk rock queer movies, and we're like, oh, we really love our weird little fucking movie. <laughs> we hope somebody else, like, likes it, you know? And the fact that, you know, this, these movies have lived on for so long, and just the shittiest copies imaginable, you know what I mean? Like, I, I saw online the other day, uh, still, um, from the scene where Jimmy's holding the cross, which is like kind of this beautifully super colorful shot, and it was literally like almost black and white and like kind of purple, and it's like, whose copy of Nowhere is that, and why are you fucking watching it? So, what I watched. Yeah, yeah I, I know, it's like, and the fact that people are watching that, and they still love the movie, and they still are obsessed with it, it's like, Jesus Christ, you guys deserve a better copy, and now, you have it, finally. <laughs> Sincerely, thank you, everybody. You guys are the fucking best. Thank you, everyone.